Stewie, long time, really, since you've been to Paris-Roubaix because you had to miss it last year. Yeah, it was a uh, certainly different aspect, learning, sitting back, watching on TV with a beer. It's not quite the same, but uh, definitely prefer to be here amongst it. Well, your man, Fabian Cancellara, is looking in fine form, but you're also, I think, in some pretty good form this season. Yeah, I think I've uh, got the same kind of form that I finished off the late year with last year, and I think it's, you know, to be honest, it's probably the best I've gone. Um, you know, with such a strong team, uh, you know, tomorrow we've, we've got the pressure, we've got the responsibility, we've got the defending champion. Um, you know, I just hope to play a pretty uh, important role in, in the team winning again tomorrow. What about yourself? Because I know this is one of the races that for many, many years you've been super motivated by. I'm excited, yeah. Uh, it's not very often I get nervous or excited before a race, but, um, you know, tomorrow's... Uh, the last week has been what I'm building up for for the last 18 months. It's all that's been going through my mind, and you know I might have to sacrifice my personal, um, you know, wants and needs tomorrow. But for Fabian, he's the clear-cut favourite. I think he's, he's a step above everyone else. But we've got to be ready in case anything happens out on the road. And if anything does happen, then then I'll be there to back it up. I hope. Tell me one thing. I, I mean, I was the same when I raced. This race was a very special race to me. You get up in the morning, you are nervous. Why is it different to any other race? in the year because it's hell the hell of the north it's uh it's dangerous it's chaos it's uh it's an adventure you know every every rider no matter if they've done 100k or 270k they get to the velodrome everyone's got their own story you know everyone's got their ups and downs and um you know everyone's been in a crash or in a near a crash and it's just the um, you know it's an adventure it's a it's a huge uh, feeling of achievement to make it to the velodrome and it's one thing to do that and, and it's one thing to be up there going for the win and I think uh, Perry Bay you, you wouldn't be here if you didn't like it okay looking back here uh, this is the front end of the main group Van Evermart just off the back end getting some mechanical assistance that's the, the only time the riders have a chance to do this is in between the cobblestone sections because on the cobblestones you need to be in complete control Matty Breschel looks as if he's got himself back into this breakaway group and Stuart O'Grady I think a big danger this afternoon everybody worried about the fact that these hot weather conditions could very much suit the Australian this is not as I said earlier the normal type of breakaway this is to be paid attention to these boys uh, know that they have a real chance of winning this race my breakaway and it's been done before it's not unprecedented it was done in the late 80s when Dirk de Mol uh, won from a long long breakaway that went at about 17 kilometers I think it was just after the gun anyway and it was in similar conditions although it certainly wasn't as warm as this uh, because this is like uh, a summer's day in the height or it could well be when, when with hindsight at the end of the year the hottest day of the year because it is very very warm well, these guys I think there's a lot of riders in this group who realize there's a, a very good chance here to create the surprise Stuart O'Grady uh, at the front here Phil he definitely read this move very carefully indeed they've uh, lost a little bit of their advantage it's four minutes and ten seconds to the group of chasers a little bit further back the last time checker got was five minutes and five seconds to the main field Yes, and uh, Radio Tour's just given us 4 minutes 20, but on television you can see 4 minutes 10, so they have uh, had their advantage reduced very slightly. <laughs>
Back up with Ralph Grabs, a rider who has had a couple of wins last year, but really has only had two wins uh, since 2002. So he's not a big winner, but he's a very strong bike rider. He certainly is. He's uh, decided to go on his own here, and I'm really a little bit surprised, full as we see the main fields at gap now at 4 minutes and 15 seconds. And uh, really, he needs to wait, I would say, for the rest of that group, because the only chance this group have got about a 20-second advantage uh, over the rest of the riders he was with a few moments ago. When he comes off this section of cobblestones, he's got about a three-kilometre ride on a smooth road before he comes to the next section, which is uh, section number 20. And then after that, Phil, he's got a long ride, about 10 or 12 kilometres before he gets to the next section of cobblestones. And I think then, if he's still only got around the 20-second advantage over the rest of that group, he'd be well advised to sit up and wait for them. Yeah, I think, he, I can only, the reason I can think he's attacking like this for is to try, A, see the cobbles himself for a little way, and hope... Hey, go on! Revitalise the move. That was Tom Steele's on the front of the group. Good to see Tom Steele's uh, in the breakaway, a man who a couple of years ago I thought was going to retire from the sport. He had uh, mononucleosis or a glandular fever, and it took him about three or four years to get back to the man that he was before. Even now it's surprising to see him racing this in this early part of the season because he had a dramatic crash in the Tour of Qatar in February where he actually broke his collarbone. And we saw him start to get competitive just about ten days ago in the three days of La Pana. Well, his best finish in this event, he podium. <laughs> A lot of racing still to be done here today. And Bert, uh, Ralph, no, this is Ralph Craig, the brother of Bert, who is uh, trying to break the field up a little bit. He's still holding on to that 20 second advantage, and there you can just see the the banner in the distance there, that's the next section of cobblestones. He's probably decided to ride these section of cobblestones just like this, Phil, because it is just a little bit safer. And there's not really on the cobbles a lot of advantage from actually strips, slipstreaming because you've, you're under so much stress concentrating on what's happening in front of the rider in front of you that you actually tend to be a lot better off riding at your own pace. Well, this is also a, a counting event in the Pro Tour circuit although it's a circuit which doesn't really capture the public's imagination that again it's another event without the current Pro Tour leader taking part it seems that when you win the Pro Tour leadership as uh, Oscar Freire did at the end of Gent Wavergum then you don't ride the next counting event that seems to be the way it's going this year and it's at this time of the year when the last two years of the Pro Tour has been decided uh, because the riders who've ridden well in the spring seem to have held on right to the end Danilo De Luca and Alessandro Valverde the two previous winners of the Pro Tour both succeeded in the Spring Classics, but not these Spring Classics. They were the ones still to come, like the Amstel Gold Race and the uh, Liège Baston Liège. <laughs> off a little bit uh, a little bit of uh, the family ties might be a bit stronger than team rivalry I think just now well, on the front of the main field it's uh, 
Team Predictor Lotto doing a lot of work as they come out of section number 21 to go, and that looked like Johan van Sommeren on the front there. They'll obviously be trying to get their man back into the race because Leif Hoster is one of the big names who's missed out on that breakaway this afternoon, and he's... <laughs> A puncture or a crash? I think it's a well, flat he's waiting. tire. He's seen a teammate stop. I wonder if it's Hushoft. Well, if he has stopped, I would expect it to be for Tor Hushoft, and Hushoft is getting a very slow change here. Looks if like it is. him. Yeah. That's Jimmy Ongelvon. Jimmy Ongelvon. But well, I can't understand why uh, Laszlo Bodrogi be waiting for this teammate because the man I think they were expecting to ride well here this afternoon was, of course, Tor. In fact, we're just hearing now that he's getting a rear wheel change as well. So. which is Parry Roubaix. This is one of the reasons why it's nicknamed the Hell of the North, because there's so much chaos. You, you have to give up in a situation like this. You've got to battle your way back into the race, and a lot of riders uh, will be off the back of the group for many, many kilometres. Then all of a sudden, they come back from nowhere because they've just had it in their stomach to ride themselves back oh. into this race. Hey, come on. His flat tyre still trying to make contact. So two strong riders there getting together should uh, get back up to the peloton. Uh, but there really is uh, no way around the flat tyres. You've just got to be lucky if you don't... Uh. I hope that somebody's going to have a flat tyre or a bit of bad luck about the same time of you as you, so you can have a little bit of company trying to get yourself back into the race. This is the leader on the road now, Grabs from Team Milram. A little bit decapitated Milram with that nasty accident that Eric Zabel had last week in the Tour of Flanders when he went down with a lot of other riders and for Zabel he, he actually said afterwards he doesn't know how he crashed because it was on a good piece of road going slightly downhill and the next minute there were about 10... <laughs> ...arched in the middle and if you have the low profile tyres on your car that most of the cars use these days you actually find that you can bang the sump and I've seen cars take their sump out on some of these cobblestone sections. Yeah. Well I've actually been upside down in one. We didn't make a corner. Uh, on one of the stretches in bad conditions and we slipped upside down into a ditch fortunately without injury just snatching the drinks there into rival of Paddy Roubaix Bram de Groot there is the rider from Rabobank who's managed to get himself into this group Matteo Tosato has got into the group from quick step now that may well be a nice tactical move if there is a rejoining by the rear here because he's a teammate of Tom Bonin who Every time I've seen the front end of the main field, Phil, has looked rather frisky. Come back again. Well, we'll find out when we get a little bit further down. Uh, this is an unbelievable section of cobblestones. It could, could tell us a whole lot of stories, not only about uh, Paris-Roubaix, but also about the Napoleonic Wars. That's the forest of Arenberg all around the riders. What a magnificent sight. Absolutely beautiful. A little oasis here in what was the middle of a big mining community. Well, they've obviously had second thoughts here. Well, actually, it's only it's buried only on one, one side. side. Yeah, it's on one side, so they've kept it clean on the left because it made it just a little bit too narrow. And they've obviously tried to get the public to queue on one side. That hasn't worked. Well, you can see now this man is starting to bounce around over these cobblestones. He's zigging and zagging left and right to try and find at least a little bit of a smoother road through here. Look at the vibrations coming up from the cobblestones right through his calf and thigh muscles and his arms. The day after Paris-Roubaix is an unbelievable feeling because every muscle in your body, even the muscles in the hands, are absolutely in pain. Well, there's the cars. Just the chief referee and one service vehicle behind. It'd be nice to get back uh, for when the peloton hit the cobbles here today. Crowd a bit down at the moment on what we normally see here in the forest. Maybe they've chosen other sites to watch the race. It looks quite a big crowd at the entry as now the breakaway is about to start the journey through the forest. I should think we'll lose a few members of this breakaway group here, Phil, once we start to come down this... Oh, the bells are ringing now. Is that the crossing coming down? Oh, that's down here. <laughs> that, <laughs> I 
Oh, sorry, everybody. That's the, they're ringing the bell down on the stadium here. We're, we're commentating, of course, from Roubaix Villadrome. I thought it was the alarm bells uh, starting to drop the crossing gates. Uh, bit nervous after what happened last year. Four and a half minutes, the gap. 93 kilometres to go. Well, there's no real acceleration yet, Phil, and that's a bit of a surprise for me. I think everybody now has uh, decided they're probably going to get caught. The group is a very large group, down to uh, less than 30 riders. One or two uh, neutral vehicles allowed to come behind the riders at this point. As we rejoin uh, Grabsch at the front, and you can just see how bad these cobblestones are. They are very bumpy cobblestones, and because this road is not used very much at all, there is also an awful lot of grass in between the joints. So Grabsch is uh, bouncing around quite a bit here. He's got uh, the red car up behind him. That's the car of the race referee. Next man uh, moving forward, this is Olaf Polak, and I'm not sure if he's in the front or the back of the group. He was in that group of about 28 riders. You can see he's trying to get over right to the right-hand side of the road just to find a slightly smoother trajectory. Exactly, he's on the sharp end. He's trying to get away from him at the moment. Olaf Pollock, as his teammate, who's also in the group. That would be um, Gajek. As the riders now just try to pick their own little path here, but this is not changing the shape of things, at least in the breakaway at the moment. As they continue to keep the pressure on. You have to take your hat off too to the skills of our motorcycle cameramen here because they have to endure the same situations as the riders and still uh, keep those cameras focused and rely totally on the pilot of the bike. Well, you might look at the time gap there because of the time gap between that group of chasers and the peloton is now starting to reduce. It's only around about two and a half minutes, so they're seriously whipping up the pace in the peloton. And strangely, it seems to have been done by Team CSC despite the fact they've got Stuart O'Grady in here. Somebody's got a problem there. I think uh, that was Stuart O'Grady. It's uh, Stuart O'Grady, and I think he has a flat tyre the way he's dropping down to the back of that group. I think it was a rear flat tyre because you could just see the, uh, the way the back end of his bike was moving. Now the main field is into the forest of Arenberg, and this is a completely different style and a completely different approach. We're looking at the riders now as they crash over the common cobblestones of the forest of Arenberg. The peloton now driving on the gap which was out of five minutes, is now in reality only a couple of minutes behind the second sector of the front breakaway. And that they are now working very hard, and surprisingly, it is uh, the Lotto Predictor team there who are driving the pace back up to the front, and this is the leader, Grabsch. The whole of the main field now is in exactly the same section of cobblestones, the forest of Arenberg. This is Grabsch, who's about to make his exit from the cobblestone section and get himself back onto the smooth roads. He's got that group behind him, which is starting to split up a fraction, but the main field were charging into this cobblestone section. They realise how important it is. Yes, Ralph Grabsch here about to turn to his left as he comes out now. It's all over for the moment. He'll get some more very shortly as he turns now and races down a good stretch of main highway here. Uh, but Grabsch, I think, living to his greatest moment because I do think there's been a big change of uh, attitude at the back here. Now there is the CSC rider and there is a four right in front of them and that's the start of the ricochet effect now as one after another. They're, oh, that's a nasty fall over the top of those two riders and I think it was all due to the CSC riders changing tyres well, and Cancelara. still struggling. That was Cancelara, Cancelara who flat was panicking on the there right. with a flat tyre. This is chaos. Uh, the problem here is there's not a lot of cars. There's a rider gone over into the ditch on the left-hand side. Uh, that was a Beppu, I think, of Team Discovery in the Japanese National Champions jersey. There's another Discovery rider there trying to figure his bike out. This is the Forest of Arenberg, and this is why this raceville is called the Hell of the North. Uh, it's a Chocolat Jacques rider so who went over into the ditch there, but now this is the chaos we're leaving behind. Uh, because I think that was caused by that wheel change to Cancellara on the right where a teammate stopped to help him and stood in the way of the oncoming bunch. Uh, that's a bit of a shame. Well, a lot of riders now will have a story to tell. And uh, these guys, I don't think, will be seeing the finish line in Roubaix now because they're going to be at the end of this cobblestone section a long way behind. This is the style of Stefan Weissemann of Team Wiesenhoff. Used to be for a long time one of the strong men in the classics for T-Mobile decided to move across this winter to a different squad and it's still very difficult despite seeing him since the start of the season in this green jersey actually getting used to it well his style is unmistakable he's a superb classics rider even now when he is uh, not quite as good as he was but Steph is now trying to move across as best he can here he's had his moments in Paris Bay his best finish he was runner-up in 2002, he desperately disappointed. He thought he was going to become 
the first uh, German to win this race uh, since Sir Joseph Fisher first won it back in 1896. Now this is the style of Tom Bone and he's also the, the spearhead of the front end of the main field too. He knows this section of cobblestones and he's a good man at riding over them. He's got, it seems to me, the ideal body weight and position to glide over the cobbles. He really is a powerful man. He's been down a little bit on his form, but he's had so much pressure on him, Phil. As after all, he's only 26 years of age, and he's won so many races throughout his career. I mean, he was the world champion last year, and this year he's already won about eight races. He spoiled the big day for George Hincapie as well uh, just a couple of years ago, when George could have won this race, but for Tom. But Tom Bonin now trying to fight his way back into the picture here, and he knows he's got to start. The foundations have got to be laid here in the forest of Arlenberg because now the cobbles come thick and fast, and you watch the crowds will also grow because from this point they can all get through to other sectors of cobblestones by using the freeways and also get through to the finish in Roubaix. Lots of feeding stations. There must have been a lot of maps out last night with the director sportifs planning where they were going to hand all these bottles up. And Bonin now wants to pull a group clear that can work with him to try and get up to those leaders. Looking over, More he's help to required. Out, he's looking for uh, these guys to start riding and working. Nico Eichhout, the Belgian national champion, he's come to the front here. This rider from Rabobank also having a flat tyre. Well, I've got a feeling uh, the rider from Rabobank there was Leon Van Bon. It looks like it was. It was Van Bonnen. Is he on the wrong side of well, the Well, he's decided to uh, take the advantage of riding down the smoothest section of the road here. Not sure that's totally legal, but I'm not well, sure the referees will be able to see that. I'd be more concerned about how he gets on. He might be able to get back through the gate there. And this rider here, Arlen Kemps, the, Russia, the uh, Australian on the Russian Astana team, or the um, Kazakhstan team, looks as though he's called it a day in the Arlenberg Forest here because he was slipping right out of contention. These riders have all been in problems. Eric Baumann was the German T-Mobile rider, who's also had problems, and that was Van Bon. Chaos here. This, if you had a if you have a problem here, Phil, you ain't getting back into this race at all because you're going to come out of the forest of Arenberg having lost yourself a good two, two and a half minutes. And there's another wheel required for Lamprey. It wasn't Balan. That's all I can tell you. I didn't quite see him quick enough. But uh, it wasn't the style of Balan, it was too small for him. 50 seconds, they're saying 154 on television, but we're probably a little bit more accurate because we're hearing commentary from the race course itself. And that was Boonen not far from the front there, just over on the left-hand side. A lot of people say that uh, he is probably one of the best riders in the main field for being able to ride along the cobblestones. Put him up alongside uh, Fabian Cancellara, whose two teammates all believe that he has the perfect body style to ride well over the cobbles. To ride well over the cobbles, you have to have a combination of not only strength, but suppleness. There's Stuart O'Grady as well, just adjusting his earpiece, so he is back in the main field. But he will have had a nice, gentle ride through the forest of Arenberg. He wouldn't have had the stress of fighting to get position, to get into a, a good place. We sat here and shivered with every piece of clothing we could muster. We are now uh, with short sleeves, summer shirts on, and the temperature is probably the top end of the 70s Fahrenheit just now which is around about 24 degrees uh, Celsius which uh, around the world it's hotter than places in Australia it's hotter than places in South Africa and we are in northern France in springtime the riders uh, one of their biggest problems today is seeking out water and keeping their liquids topped up uh, because the, of the dryness of racing over the cobbles the dust is in their mouths they're getting dry mouths and of course uh, they've really got to stay on top of the hydration problem today because this is a long race in extreme conditions 260 kilometers and it's been a good race so far because the breakaway has shaped a different type of Paris-Roubaix different by at least a millimeter sector 14 at Tilloir now brings us up to 2.4 kilometers of cobblestones Wiesenhoff on the front rider from Wiesenhoff will be Gaziek. On the main field now at a minute and 40 seconds as they left that final section of cobblestones. It's slowly but surely starting to come back together and we've still got a lot of very difficult, very dangerous cobbles before we get to the finish line. I have a feeling that this early morning breakaway that looked as if it was going to turn the race upside down is not going to have its taste of glory this afternoon. Not yet. 70 kilometres though still to go. A minute 40. They are coming back. All of the big boys are in there as far as we know. 
and Predictor Lotto are now driving this in favour of Leif Hoster, the rider who got third, second place for the third time in the Tour of Flanders. Actually stayed in the same hotel as us the next day, and he was getting plenty of congratulations for second, and why not? Uh, but he was disappointed. He wanted to say he won that race on one occasion. It's Lee Foster riding there in third place, and that's to rally the troops around him to show them that uh, he's in fine form this afternoon, and just to give them the encouragement to ride that little bit harder. He did used to ride for Team Discovery Channel there. He's talking uh, on his race radio there to the team manager to try and figure out just exactly what the time gap is. But that group, Phil, you will see is actually split a fraction because there are no cars behind it. There's a small group of riders who would tail off the back because of the pressure on that last section of cobblestones. And it'll continue to be applied here because somebody left the door open at the back of the peloton and now somebody else is going to have to try and close it. But that's quite a big group that they've got rid of there and it should uh, lose further ground now. They've gone onto that section of cobblestones of 2.4 kilometres and that gap will probably open a little bit. One of the sections of the cobblestones that I fell off when I was in the winning breakaway when Henny Kuiper went on to win. But on that occasion, it was a little bit damp. I remember. You could hardly recognize the riders, never mind a little bit damp. They were covered in mud from head to toe. The three star section of cobblestones here, but they certainly are now putting the hammer down, trying to put the gap between themselves and everybody else. Oster now is uh, picking up a couple of riders. In fact, he's picking up Tom Steele's here, his own teammate, and he's gone by. And I wonder if he had time to just shout to him there and say, Tom, have you got any power left? But no, thank you very much. He's got on his wheel a CSC rider as well. I can't tell you who it is from this altitude. I, I think it looks like the shape and size of Lars Mikkelsen again, but we'll find out shortly. The rider also there going back with Tom Steele was Iriondo from Uskatelu And there is the spread now as the cobbles cause a little bit of problem for one or two riders. This is a sector which has often brought about accidents. And that's Lars Maitler saying, it's Fabian Cancellara. Well, does it look like Fabian Cancellara? Well, they've obviously got it from somewhere. Situation, I think, but Mikkelsen, who retires today, is trying 
uh, to go out in a blaze of glory and I think his own team would help him get it if he could do it. Well, he's twice finished fifth in Paris-Roubaix in the past. He loves this race. You have to love this race to, to come here and perform every year. And it is Tom Bonin on the front there who's decided to nail them back. So Bonin has and taken control himself and he's right on the back of that move by Leif Hoster. He's paying attention. He's feeling confident at this stage of Paris-Roubaix. There's Cancellar, about five riders from the front man. And I think O'Grady's still hanging on. Well, I've got a feeling that Vladimir Gusev has just joined the back of this group, the young uh, man who's uh, being talked about as a real superstar to go. Now look at this. Uh, Boonen has done a great ride to reach them and he looks rather upset they've slowed down like that. Yeah, well, they've slowed down because they're going through a feeding section. Everybody who needs to take on board drinks. It's very hot this afternoon at around about uh, 25 degrees Celsius. There are 21 riders in that group with Cancellara and Tom Bona, but I think, again, Phil, it may well swell a fraction because I think they will slow down once they've seen that hardly anybody was missing out. Just the big... Uh, he wasn't too bad either in the Gen Webelgen race just in the middle of last week looking at that group of riders now the separation between the leading group of riders and the main field with most of the main contenders in it is down to a mere minute in fact it looks a little bit less than a mere minute to me it does it looks but they're, they're both sat up it's feeding time at the zoo now the, right, the boys are all having a rest in both groups while they just load the food and drink out of those little musettes or go around to all of the festivals in the north of france and uh, the southern part of belgium throughout the year Again, we can see this acceleration, and this looks to me as if we're trying to rip the place to pieces. Well, there's still a lot of fight in these riders at the moment. I've seen that guy with the yellow anorak on about 15 times. I think he's been he's getting around the course here to hand up the out. drinks. He's had his maps out. There's the Australian flag as well. There's plenty of Australians leaving a lasting mark on this year's Harry Roubaix. Stones with Kevin Van Imp, oh, David Pollock. Kopp, and Pollock is the other rider who's managed to get up there from Jason Hopp. It's an interesting move by Pollock, a man that carries quite a punch when it comes to a sprint. He won the stage of the Criterium International this year. These riders are committed but not fully committed because they know what lies ahead. They know this can't be a winning move yet and they're waiting to see if the others are going to take an interest and rejoin and they're just doing enough that's why Polak is looking over his shoulder just seeing what's happening well what he'll see is the chase is coming back just looking at the group here they're uh, not too far behind but again it that has thinned out Paul that, that group has been halved on that last stretch of cobblestones it's a very strange race for the moment because this group they've got it in their minds now that they're going to get caught so they don't want to use too much energy but they haven't been caught because the main field hasn't yet quite turned up the gas so we're seeing the race will uh, go apart and come back together and go apart until finally we get to a long hard section of cobblestones and then we will see I think a definitive selection again this is Lars Mikkelsen he's decided here to keep the pressure on a lot on this section of cobblestones Peter van Pietigam is uh, actually at the back of this group there you can just see uh, Tom Bonham with his world championship bands on his sleeves there he's looking rather good too well, so the three front runners now, they're looking at 65 seconds, the gap to this group here, being led by Tom Bonin. And Kevin Van Imper is Tom Bonin's teammate in that leading three riders. Kevin uh, Van Imper is the nephew, in fact, of uh, the former Tour de France winner, Lucien Van Imper. But these guys here have got themselves, you see, this is a very strange situation. They've got themselves a gap, but they're looking over the shoulders because nobody wants to work. Tom Bonin getting a bit frustrated by the tactics, I think. Uh, it's going to take a decision sooner or later to go for it. But at the moment, it's status quo. Mark Lars Mikkelsen setting the pace again now, giving Tom Bonin a hand. Ha Bonin will be pleased about that because Mikkelsen's team carries Cancellara as the possible winner. It's a little bit interesting that Bonin himself is doing a lot of work here in this chase group and not calling this. He's going to split the field, I think. Meanwhile, this is life at the front with the press and television all around the three leaders. who are still looking very good. Pollock is doing nothing at all in this breakaway. He's sitting third man all of the time. It's Kevin Van Impel and David Kopp who seem to be doing the big share of the work. Now that's the corner which invariably in the old days of Paris Bay when it rained every day is covered.
covered in flood water and the number of riders who fell there. Well, in fact, I was just going to remind you of uh, another story about um, my fall on this section of cobblestones. I crashed on this section of cobblestones for the ninth time, and I decided I was going to stay on the floor. I wasn't going to get up anymore because I was fed up. And the crowd just came in from the side of the road. They picked me and the bike up as one and pushed me off, and I kept going again just for them, and I got to the finish line in Roubaix. And they probably thought you were very ungrateful when you never said thank you. Well, I went back the next day, but they'd all gone. Oh, dear. French flag at last we found it in France. We mostly Belgian so far. Gap of 36 seconds is to the first chase group. And here they are. 46 kilometers to go. Sooner or later, the big boys are going to have to wipe this, uh, these gaps out and get back into the thick of the action. At the moment, they're not doing that. There's still a little chance here that this breakaway may succeed. It's a tenuous one. A lot of big boys in the group behind though want to try and pull it all back together if they can because Tom Boone and still looking for the win. Lee Hoster is also looking for the win. And uh, let's not forget Fabian Cancellara has got a very fine pair of legs on him here this afternoon and he can bridge a minute's gap, I would say, on any section of cobblestones still to go. And we've still got a couple of five-star sections of cobblestones. The most difficult, I think, is the fourth to go the Carrefour de Labra. That is a question of just riding for survival. If you've got any power left at all, that's the place to make the move. Well, Kopp here seems to be using every bit of power he's got at the moment. 14 wins to his credit. He had a good result last year in Get Wavergun when he finished second. Oh, and there's a faller there as they went round the corner. That was the first man down. That was Stuart O'Grady who hit the deck. Unlike Stuart to lose his wheels, he's up pretty quick. Just a slip on the mud, well, on the dust. Well, not too far away in there from him was, of course, uh, Tom Boonham, but he went around that corner in second place. A lot of the riders saying as well, Phil, that uh, despite the fact that it's not muddy today, this race is also made fairly r fairly scary and precarious by the fact that there's a lot of sand on the cobblestones here, and that makes it pretty slippy too. This is Lars oh, Mikkelsen. Oh, what a great ride he's having in his farewell race. He's really riding superbly Lars today as he comes off that sector. 10, about five or six riders with him, so he's ripped away from the main field. As a rider there has gone into the crowd, I'm not too sure what happened. Oh, he's gone right into the crowd line. It was a optically loose. I thought he left the course. Uh, well, Lars has left this group and dragged a few riders clear with him. So again, the race is starting to change face. You know, this is going to be a very difficult race down towards the end because uh, the way these guys are going now, I think the heat is actually having a fairly serious effect. This is probably the hottest day of the year so far in Europe. And for many of the riders, they always worry about that happening because it's, it's the first time of the year that the body has to change and get used to racing in the cold. Although the weather was good last week in the Tour of Flanders, we didn't really go above the 20 degrees Celsius mark. No, we had that ice in the wind, but that's all gone now. This is a summer day. I mean, there's no question about it. And uh, they're, they're telling us it's the hottest day that Paddy Roubaix has ever experienced since it started in 1896. Joseph Fischer of Germany won that race, by the way. Champion of Belgium, Ekout, coming through near his camera. I know now he's unzipped his complete tunic there and trying to trap all the air. This, they're riding like they would ride in the Tour de France with the zips down at this stage of the race. Quite amazing to see this temperature, and that's, I think, what's going to make it a rather strange race over the last hour of racing because it will be the rider who's looked after his, his food and drink the best who will actually come up with the goods towards the end there the rider who's still fit the rider who's still got that little bit of energy left in his legs if you've not been eating and drinking properly throughout today's stage you'll actually blow up at the end well just look at the faces of these riders they are really struggling now that dust you see is flying about a little bit little chance for a few deep breaths and smooth road again as they come off for sector 10 Freshel, Besserman, Fletcher and here it is coming up 25 kilometers just on 15 miles from the finish and now they're gonna have to rethink their tactics this group is now swelling and immediately and not surprisingly an attack well that looks like Stuart O'Grady and I well, don't know where he's come from but if it is a Grady we never saw him hook up at the back end of the group we may have slipped down with the cameras here because O'Grady was in the previous group it's certainly O'Grady, that's for sure. Well, as Stuart O'Grady wears there, number seven rides for Australia. He's got some of the finest form of his career this last week of racing. And he now is going again, Phil, onto the next section of cobbles. 
So Stuart O'Grady, the man who has never learned to say no to anything as a bike rider, is now heading on to the cobblestones, Paris Roubaix. We don't know how he reached those leaders, but he must have somehow got around that group and joined the eight front runners. There is O'Grady in amongst the traffic. He's got the camera alongside him. These are the chases with Fletcher. They've now picked up Kopp and Van Imp. And that was the sign for O'Grady to launch the attack. The man who burst out of the shadow of the chase group. No idea where he came from at all. This is Leif Hoster now in the next group. This is the group with Tom Bonin, Marcus Burkhardt, Le uh, Stein de Volde over there on the left hand side. Everybody now, Phil, is trying to throw caution to the wind. He's Stein de Volde having a go now. 40 seconds is the gap, and the orders have gone out to stop all the cars, and there they are, stopped. The referees want nothing in the gap now. This is a pursuit of the favourites against the hopefuls. And it's a very strange Paris Bay, but it's a great one. It Stein de Volder here, the leader of that is Grabsch, and this is O'Grady. Here he is now. And I think if anybody deserves the win today, it's got to be O'Grady, and it would be a great win. He has a 15-second advantage now over that group. He's come off the section of cobbles at Borgel. The next section is a very long section that he will face too, as the Campin en Pevel, a long section which got a little bit of an incline in it. That's the section where a few years ago we saw George Hincapi crash into the ditch and his teammate at the time uh, rose to the occasion and his teammate was called Tom Bonin. Since then, Bonin has flowered to say the least, but he's been put in his place a little bit just now. He's tried to make his moves. He hasn't had the strength to drive them home. He was outmaneuvered by O'Grady, obviously, when he did that counter-attack. We're only 22 kilometers from the finish now. Leif Hoster and Fletcher, flick of the arm, coming through and give me a hand. Well, I think Fletcher's done a pretty lot of work today, but I'm not sure whether he's got much strength left behind him. Another man who's finished in runner-up position in Paris-Roubaix is Stefan Besserman. So we're looking now at Stuart O'Grady as he goes for goal. Just five kilometers of cobblestones remain on today's Paris-Roubaix. I'll tell you what, Paul, those five kilometres are going to be uh, something rather special for O'Grady. It's not over by any manner of means yet, but 51 seconds at this moment in time, O'Grady is going away. You are looking at a class bike rider. You see now, he's only just now decided. Under one minute ahead, and Tom Bonin, trying to reach the chase group of eight, is also in a spot of bother now, being impeded by the following cars. He's going to have to get round that problem. He's in a group of four, but O'Grady has gone for goal some 25 kilometers from the finish, and for the moment, he is pulling away. The amazing thing is, Billy, he came across in the total confusion. We have no idea where he came from, but all of a sudden, he launched himself into the lead. This is the second group on the road. The group of Juan Antonio Fletcher behind this group at around about 30 seconds is still Tom Bone and chasing, trying to get himself into contact. But when he contacts this group, he's going to find himself a long way behind, and Fletcher has now gone. Fletcher has launched an attack, I think to be expected, he's got tremendous strength, uh, but they're all just fighting for any wheel they can find up right now and dodging the holes in the road at the same time. This is Panic Stations in Paris-Roubaix, the 105th running of the event, and an Australian is trying to seek a win here, and if he does, he'll be the first Australian not just to win, but the first Australian ever to get on the podium. Tête de la course, he'd be very happy to see that because he understands what that means in French. That means the front of the race. This is the left-hand turn. Now look at the dust, the sand that's all over these cobblestones. He has now got himself a minute advantage over Juan Antonio Fletcher. This climbs up. It's a very difficult piece of cobblestones, Phil, on the left-hand side over the top. You'll see the little cafe called the Cafe, cafe de l'Arbre. And this is Fletcher. They've caught him back again. Fletcher hadn't got the legs to go alone. He didn't have an O'Grady in those legs. Stefan Besserman is the first rider to bring the group alongside. Lars Mikkelsen behind Besserman. Mikkelsen will be feeling pretty content with his work now because O'Grady is riding away. It's one minute and one second the gap now. Stuart O'Grady over the chase. Well, O'Grady, once he gets to the end of this cobblestone section, has really only got two big sections to go, the section of Gruzon and the section of M. But we do have to get ourselves through the railway crossing, well, which was... Uh, point now, Paul, where you cross your toes, your fingers, your thumbs, because you don't want a flat tyre at this stage. And every time your bike clatters on those cobblestones, you must wonder if one will snap the tyre. 
Well, O'Grady now is doing the ride of his life. He's been threatening a ride like this for two years, and it's coming today. And I really feel he deserves to win it now. Well, he certainly does, but there's still a long way to go from here, and anything can happen. Bad luck can be with anybody on the road on the run in towards the Roubaix Stadium. But O'Grady, what a terrific finish that would be for him, Phil, because throughout his career, he's been one of the greatest track riders in the world. And to finish here on a stadium like this, I think he will enjoy that dramatically, but he's still got to get there. And this is back with Tom Bonin here now, but again, I think they're being slowed a little bit by the cars still. Uh, these motorbikes are getting too close as well. End of sector four for the Australian champion, or South Australian champion he is at the moment, as he swings onto a nice, clean stretch of road where he can accelerate. The crowds are huge now. He snatches a bottle with the ease of anything you like. Over the neck goes the water, back to the dust goes the bottle. A minute and 10 seconds, but only a minute 31 to Boone, and Boone is catching up. Stuart O'Grady now onto the next section. This is the section uh, of a Gruzon. It's 1.1 kilometers long, but it's not that bad because at the side of it, halfway along, you've got a little bit of tarmac. Grady trying to get the motorbike out of his way. He's used it on a number of occasions as a friend. Now he's finding it becoming a little bit of an enemy. This is the second group there, led by Stefan Weissemann. So far, 40 seconds have gone by since Stuart O'Grady went round that corner at the top, and still the clock ticks by. Stefan Weissemann, another hero of Paris-Roubaix in years gone by, still finding the legs to drive on this chase group. The riders being baked by the hottest sun in the history of the race. But this man knows all about hot sun coming from South Australia at this time of the year. A problem there for Lars Mikkelsen. Well, all I can say is thank heavens it wasn't his teammate O'Grady. Mikkelsen has to get back in the action. Here's what he did. He knew he had a flat tyre and he went straight in, he skidded on his shoe cleats, grabbed the bike. That was a bike change, that was that a was planned a plan. bike change, was that was unbelievable, the mechanics were there. Very, oh, oh, and this is what, that's him going down again. That's exactly, oh dear. He got himself straight back up, he's riding just a little bit too fast there as he went round the corner to try and make contact with that group again. It's almost as if Mikkelsen, the teammate of O'Grady, is showing us the problems that which can still exist in Paris-Roubaix. And thank heavens that O'Grady is staying clear and riding safely. It's about time to tell you that O'Grady, one of the finest track riders in the world in years gone by, can handle his bike better than most. Well, O'Grady's off the section now of Gruzon. <laughs> Despite I make it around about uh, seven kilometers now as Tom Boonen has ridden away from his group on that section of cobblestones and he's starting to pick up riders one by one. Well, he might well have gone past David Kopp there, who was in the lead earlier, as Tom Boonen now has to cross the void alone. So Tom Bonin there is ridden away from the group and he's going to very shortly ride off the section of cobblestones here at Gruzon. He's just gone past there, Lars Mikkelsen, who's having a little bit of a problem getting his legs going once again after that crash. Well, this is a fine do-or-die effort here by Tom Bonin. He's managed to shake all of the gadflies that he was with and he's now going to reach these leaders by himself. These are desperate moments. He knows time is running out. He knows <laughs> Tom Bonin.
Bonin because Bonin has caught and passed him because he went down with that crash on the cobblestone section. Bonin, though, Phil, you have to say, is riding like a real champion here. He will not give up his Paris-Roubaix at all. He dreams about these races, the Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix, and he's trying to ride himself up to a podium position. But I think today, Stuart O'Grady is too far away from him. At the moment, but this man is full of surprise. I think it must be Matty Breschel, the CSC man, still able to cause a little bit of confusion. There, just ahead of Bow, the lonely rider, the man cutting the pail, the, cutting the trail towards Roubaix, where no Australian has ever been in this position to win before. They've never had a man on the podium. There is Vesemann, Leukemans, Petito, and Fletcher is the group here. And this is the group that Tom Bonin is just off the shirt tails of. Well, these four riders now, Phil, although they're riding, they're not riding with a lot of gusto, and they will very shortly, I think, be joined there by Tom Bonin, who's riding across this gap. But for Stuart O'Grady, what's more important is that little clock on the left-hand side there, which shows 13 kilometers to go to the finish. His gap is not huge, though. It has come down a fraction to 47 seconds, and Boonen is quite a long way behind because Boonen, they're saying, is at a minute 27. So the riders we must be seeing just ahead... And that little chaos in front of him, that is the group with Fletcher. Well, I think all the men that matter who will affect the result are over safety, the level crossing, which saw the disqualification of three riders last year. Vladimir Gusev, Peter Van Petergum, and uh, another rider I've completely forgotten right now, but it'll come back later. As we're now looking at the chase here with Bowen. Here misses. Now he's going to flip onto the last sector of cobbles, and these don't hurt. They're quite smooth. They put them in as a sort of tribute to Paris Roubaix. When he comes off them, he'll enter the stadium to an enormous cheer. And he will be waiting for that moment. This is a moment he's dreamed about, and he now knows as he sees the Flamme Rouge, the red kite there, Phil, that he's only got 1,000 metres to go, and around about 750 of those metres are on a velodrome where he's really, in the world of professional cycling, carved out his reputation. This is the track. He's seeing it first. He knows he's won now. He's got to go around the stadium one and a half times as he flips into the road that takes him to the entry to the velodrome. The arrival of this great race coming home yet again for the 105th time and it's being led for the first time ever by an Australian cyclist. Here's the entry to the velodrome. Listen to the crowd. Well, An enormous cheer, the tongue comes out, the cheeky little man, Stuart O'Grady, it's a classic position for him. He knows all about track cycling and he's done it. He can master any track in the world, usually in a gold medal position. Today he is mastering Paris-Roubaix. He knows he's got it now, Phil. All he's got to do is ride 500 more metres and this is really basically a lap of honour here for Stuart O'Grady. He's three quarters of a way round now, he's on the far side. He's going to really enjoy this. This has been the greatest ride of his life, and he won this the same way as he won the Commonwealth Gold Medal in Manchester on the road. Stuart O'Grady is down the back straight. His pursuers aren't in the stadium. It's all over. His chance to take the applause now. Never before has an Australian stepped up into the first three. They start at the top. O'Grady is about to win Paris-Roubaix for the best win of his career and his 46th road race win of his life and he'll remember this forever and what a way to win it from the break back to the bunch back to the break to win on your own a classic win for a classic bike rider he's promised this for many many years and he really has dreamed i think about winning this race 42 kilometers an hour as o'grady has now crossed the line he's won paris roubaix and now he can try and get his breath back but these guys have still got to fight it out phil for second place Bjorn Lukemans, who was also in that early morning break, leads them through here as O'Grady gets mobbed on the infield. If our camera can find the race for second, we'll tell you what's going on. But at the moment, it's still Lukemans on the front. Fletcher trying to get a Spanish rider on the podium and equal Spain's best ever position. As we're now racing here for the second place, Bonin is also on the track, but he won't catch up now. And this could be another remarkable result for Spain, but watch out for Steph Westman. He may have to second, settle the third, though. And this is a great result for Spain, equaling their best ever finish of 1958. As Fletcher gets that, Vesseman gets third position over the line. Born Lukemans gets fourth as they chase them down now. Tom Bonin right up behind them on the line, finishing just behind Roberto Petito. He actually caught the group on the finishing line. That's a great ride by Tom Bonin. He wouldn't give up at all, but it's been a brilliant ride and a brilliant afternoon for Stuart O'Grady. 
He won it in magnificent style, Phil. He won it in the way of a true champion. And the amazing... Last year's winner in this group, but only too pleased when he looks across to see that Stuart O'Grady is the man receiving all the kisses, the hugs, and the pats on the back. So this will be seen as a great result. Cancellara, where's number one? And going through on the inside now is a man riding his last race, Lars Mikkelsen, trying to finish off with a little bit of a flourish. But it's all in the slipstream now of what has been a very strange race in many ways, but a great addition of Paris-Roubaix, because at the end of the day, the early breakaway did decide the result, although nobody would ever have predicted quite... It's a dream, you know, uh, it's been a, a dream my whole, my whole career since I began cycling, and uh, yeah, you always hope that, you know, I always believe that I could do it. Um, you know, we just have such a strong team. You know, Fabian was leader for the day, and that was 100% we were behind him. But, uh, you know, like every dog has his day, man, and today that was my day. What went through your mind when you decided to take off in that in that breakaway group so early in the race? Did you did you were you already thinking about victory, or was that just a, a team a team order? That was the plan. It was the tactic. Um, I knew it was going to be a weird Paris Bay. Uh, it was such good weather. It, you know, uh, I knew a breakaway was going to go a long way, and you know, when when we started, when I punctured on Darrenberg, I thought it was all over. You know, um, I'd waste a lot of energy out the front, and uh, but you know, when you see your team up there, Mikkelsen, Cancellara, Lindquist, uh, Matty Breschel, you know, all the boys have just done a, a phenomenal job all day, and when you're up there in numbers, you win races, and uh, you know, <laughs> it's unreal, man. When you when you saw Paris Roubaix for for the first time when you were, when you were a child, uh, it made you want to, to become a, a cyclist. Now you win it. <laughs> Man, you got no idea. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I didn't even know road racing existed in Europe. Uh, never heard of Paris Roubaix. Um, but when I saw that cassette, it was uh, you know I was mesmerised. It, it just looked like the biggest adventure, and you know I was hooked straight away. And you know, my, I remember coming into. One of my dreams was just to make it to this velodrome and it took me about four goes and I was about 45 minutes behind the leader and uh, all delay and no one was here and but I was just so happy to make it and uh, dreams come true, man. And you still had that energy in your legs in the final kilometers to, to take off once again and, and go for, for the win? Yeah, look, you know, um, you know we're going to win this race no matter what today. Uh, I said to the boys this morning, you know, we're going to win or die trying and... You know, that was 100%. That was not a millimetre more I could do, and it was the right moment to go. You know, everyone looked pretty stuffed, um, and we had numbers up the front, and there's no holding back today, man.